Hello and welcome to episode number 257 of the Armin Show podcast. We are here in the place to be. I'm here with guest Professor Peter T. Coleman from Columbia University. Shout outs to Columbia. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Armin. This is a great thing. I always like to make little connections. I not too long ago had Dr. Azra Raza from Columbia University. She lab partners with Siddhartha Mukherjee. They both are uh, cancer doctors there. And you're also at Columbia. Do you like it? Do I like Columbia? Yes. Yeah, it's a great, it's been a uh, very supportive environment for me and for my work. And so, uh, you know, and it's a vibrant place. Students are fantastic. The faculty are great, progressive, innovative. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a great place to be. Mm -hmm. Before we get into some of the material, material which is connected to this, but still slightly different, Right now, New York, you're in New York, is that correct? That's right. Yes. It is in a current moment. How would you describe the moment as being in it related to the pandemic? Well, it's very, it's odd. Um, you know, it's spooky. I was out this morning going to a, um, a uh, pharmacy to pick up some medication. And, um, you know, the streets are pretty desolate, um, quiet. Um, you know, it's, so it's unlike pretty much any experience I've had in New York, maybe similar somewhat to post 9-11, immediately post 9-11, but, but even then there were folks out. And so this is a, this is a very, very strange time. There's a lot of anxiety, I think, because of the number of cases, the exponential growth of the cases here and the impact it's having on the medical, um, people, you know, staff and facilities here, um, you know, so it, it gives you pause because even cutting vegetables for dinner, you, I'm very mindful of the fact that if, you know, if I cut myself, what do I do? <laughs> you know, no recourse at this point for medical support um, unless it's acutely problematic. So, so it's definitely a pervasive concern of everybody here and, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, we've been isolating for two weeks now. Uh, my son, I have a 23 year old son who's here with us and my wife and I, and uh, you know, so it's a, it's a very strange, unusual time. And that's true. New York is currently the epicenter of it in the United States. Other places are starting to pop up as more cases show up, but New York is like 10 times Los Angeles as far as number of cases. Yeah, right. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Somebody mentioned it's sort of like because it's a port that people enter first. It's so active, everybody's close to each other, so it had more likelihood of that. Yeah, high density, and I think also just the nature of this particular virus, which about eighty percent of the cases um, are either asymptomatic or, or you know, low symptoms, sim um, moderate symptoms, and so people, you know, have had it for a month or longer and not aware of it, and so we sort of went about our life. And um, and now we're really experiencing. So yeah, it's the it's the population density. It's the fact that our location that so many people come through here, um, and then the nature of this illness, which I think will have its impact elsewhere. Mm -hmm. This is true. Now to return to your content, you are a professor who is skilled, especially. I like to always look at expertise in conflict resolution and you are a professor at Columbia University Psychology and Education. How did you get to currently where you are? What was the path and why did you choose this category? Um, so I became interested, I mean, I think I've long been interested in social conflict because I grew up in Chicago in the late 60s, early 70s, when there was a lot of tumult in that, at that time, there was a lot of political tumult, oh. uh, you know, there were, uh, demonstrations and marches in the streets when I was 10 years old. And so I remember that vividly, but I, I got particularly interested in this field when I worked for uh, inpatient psychiatric units for a while in Florida and then back in New York City and worked with um, adolescents, many of whom were violent and had come into an inpatient facility to get off of drugs and to reduce their sentences. They were oftentimes had been um, indicted or convicted of crimes 
<clears throat> you know, sentenced to because of everything from murder to drug trafficking to other assaults and burglary. And so it was a violent population that I worked with and um, I felt uh, sort of a natural capacity to relate to them and to work with them and to try to de-escalate situations. But I had no intellectual understanding of what I was doing. I was just trying to build relationships with people so that when things got dicey, I could sort of leverage those relationships to de-escalate. But again, I didn't, I wasn't really aware of what I was doing um, conceptually. And so I started to read and I found a, a, an emeritus professor at Columbia named Morton Deutsch who had studied uh, peace and conflict resolution for most of his career. His, he, he was inspired, he was in World War uh, II, flew 30 some sortie missions as a navigator over, over Berlin, you know, and then came home. Um, and in the aftermath of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he got very concerned about the world and how we solve problems. Um, he saw that war, World War II, as a just war, but he was concerned about the extraordinary potential for violence that was emerging. Um, and so he, he became a, a theorist and an academic, studying the conditions under which you know, conflict goes well or goes poorly, um, and you know, issues around social justice and, and related issues. So he, I came to work with him. I studied under him. He had launched, he had founded the center, which is now called the Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution, which I've directed for 20 years. And uh, so as you know, he was retired and I worked closely with him for many years and then became director of the center and so I've stayed there. So my, my interest started working with violent adolescents in a place that would get very violent, this, this hospital setting, you know, there were, we, we brought in a violent population, they would escalate, Sometimes they'd call in a SWAT team. And because I had relationships with some of these youth, I could, um, I could go sort of in front and, and try to de-escalate the situation before it got out of control. And those experiences I thought were, were powerful and valuable. Um, and yet, as I said, I didn't really understand what I was doing. So I went back to Columbia to sort of study how that work is done, what works, what doesn't. And I found Deutsch and his research to be highly impactful and um, promising and powerful. And so I sort of continued in that realm. Huh. I've noticed that oftentimes there's something you do early on in life. You just do it. It's your default. It might be something genetic or a talent is connected. And then later on you wonder, wait a minute, well, why did I do that versus other people didn't look in that way? or try that a lot of times or take risks in that category? What was different than you start to analyze? Yeah, I think that's right. And that, that definitely is part of my history. I mean, I grew up in a family that had conflict and within my family, that was part of it. But the macro context that we were in in Chicago at the time was also the, the sort of political context was also very vivid uh, in, in my memory and um, you know, and then as I, you know, as I say later, I found myself on these units with, you know, oftentimes poor, um, you know, young people. They were from 12 to 28 year olds that were on this unit. They were usually from extreme, you know, extreme poverty or, or ghettos. Um, they were in an environment where this was pretty normal for people to get violent and move into crime and gangs. Um, and so I was interested in how do you change something like that? I, I felt, you know, talking to them one-on-one -on -one was powerful, but insufficient because as soon as they'd leave, they'd go back to their communities and go back to the patterns. And so I became very interested in how do you change such chronic patterns in societies? And I decided not to follow clinical work, working one-to-one -one with them, but to try to understand more socially uh, the structures that um, exist that perpetuate those kinds of problems. Um, and so that, you know, so that experience was very vivid for me and was very uh, formative in my work. Hmm. Something you mentioned there that I take account of, you said ages 12 to 28, which comes to mind as the brain isn't fully developed most of those years and also hormones are really kicked up. Is that the age demographic that is most 
apt for conflict resolution? Well, <clears throat> I mean, so, you know, we, we experience conflict immediately, you know, uh, internal conflict, social conflict, right? mother doesn't feed us in time, there's conflict, you know, so, so conflict happens right out of the gate. Um, they have found that young people, uh, you know, we've worked with as early as preschoolers um, in helping mostly their, their adults, the adults that care for them, model constructive process of conflict resolution. But early on, you know, children can learn how to negotiate, how to problem solve collaboratively. They can learn all of those things early on. Um, definitely conflicts become um, more intensified in adolescence when <clears throat> pardon me, children are, are uh, separating from their parents and from adults, you know, in middle school, there's a big transition for children from listening to their parents and seeing them as the most important people to seeing their friends as the most important people. And so in those times, you know, slights and alienation and isolation from your friends, it's huge. Identity is in flux and developing. And as you say, there are hormonal and cognitive challenges that are at play. Um, so they're definitely a population that is probably susceptible to conflict. Um, but as I said, you know, it, it happens immediately. It's, it happens all of our life. Um, and so part of what, you know, we study and, and more Deutsch studied was what are the conditions where conflicts go well or go poorly? Because conflict is such a central driver to our own learning and intimacy and, and growth as, in relationships and growth in society and advancements and innovation and creativity, technology. You know, conflict has so many benefits when it goes well mm -hmm. and when it's managed constructively, um, but it also has all these pathologies associated with it. Um, so yes, adolescents definitely have their flavor of conflicts, which can be very, can certainly be experienced by them as profound. Um, but they're to some degree no more, I think, susceptible to good and bad conflict than the rest of us. Mm. What are some examples of where... Have, have there been any cases where you have been called in to assist between older individuals in some sort of conflict or what kind of um, examples have shown up where you have been pulled in to provide that kind of resource for a group or people? Well, I was initially trained, uh, so more formally, you know, formally I was initially trained as a mediator by the New York State criminal court system here. So when I started to study uh, conflict resolution, I became more aware of mediation as a, as a process, and so I was trained in it and then worked as a community mediator in a community mediation center for a bit. Um, and then, you know, I think I, what started to happen as I studied it and became interested in more difficult conflicts is um, I would on occasion um, be drawn into various types of initiatives that were very high conflict. So one example is um, my first year on faculty at Columbia, there was a, a major uh, spike in racial tensions um, within the community, uh, within the college I, I function in, and it, it <laughs> was initially triggered by some comments made at the faculty meeting and some responses to that on email, but it, it just escalated acutely and suddenly. And um, the sort of new white administration of the, you know, of the college was, you know, sort of thrown for it. And I wrote a letter to the president at the time recommending that they see it as an opportunity to really take on the issues of racial tensions and implicit bias and, you know, the things that sort of perpetuate racism and, and discrimination. Um, and so he rewarded me by sort of asking me to take on a task force to sort of address it, which uh, was terrifying because I was non-tenured, white, young, you know, new to the faculty, um, and this was an issue around racism that grew into an issue around, you know, misogyny and gender discrimination and, you know, all, sort of many of the differences that exist. So I put together 
know, I, I negotiated the terms under which I do that. I insisted that the most vocal uh, voices in the dispute be invited into the committee, the task force, and that I co-chair it with a person of color, with influence in the, in the university. So we put together this working task force that worked for several months over the summer of 1999, very, very intense experience. Um, you know, it was a challenging experience, one of the most challenging experiences I've had but ultimately culminated in, I think, real reforms at the, at the institution in that we were able to sort of put out a report with a set of recommendations, including one that they, you know, create an office of a vice president of diversity and community, that they bring in people of color and start to change the structure, of the, you know, the, basically the demographics of the leadership structure there, um, and really commit to this as a fundamental to the mission of the college. And, um, and they did, you know, they, I mean, just frankly, I think there was, there was so much threat from litigation and potential lawsuits that were happening that they needed to do something substantive. And so I took advantage of that, or we took advantage of that to really ask for the institution to commit fully to it. So it was a, very difficult process, you know, again, I as a white male, um, privileged white male in that environment, um, took a lot of heat and vitriol in the process. The conversations, the meetings were very tense, um, but we were able to sort of navigate it and learn and grow to trust each other. And then ultimately, I think, affect real sustained reform in the institution. So. So that's an example of something I've done. I've, you know, I've worked a lot with the UN, with different components of the UN. I helped found a, what they call a mediation advisory council for their Department of Political Affairs because you know, we do research on things like mediation, but the UN, because they're just so crisis driven, they have very little time to learn from practices, of, from scholarship and academic research. And so we constituted a, a mediation advisory council to bring uh, academic research to the forefront of that work. You know, so I've done a lot of work within settings like that and the World Bank and elsewhere. Uh, I've done some international projects, always with local people that are much more informed about the local context than I am. Um, but I do try to bring insight from our research or from science uh, to bear on, on, on real challenges. Mm. It's nice when there's a moment to take that moment and suddenly it is a great application for something, usually. There's yeah. usually moments for each thing. One thing that comes to mind is, what are some of the key elements that are required for this conflict? Does it have to be between two individuals who don't understand each other is a big part of it like bridging the gap or is it usually that one side doesn't have full understanding of the other side is it usually both ends or more on one end well so conflict is a complex thing there are different types of conflicts you know and some are simply a misunderstanding um, but there are also real conflicts and they may be you know value differences that are profound like today, we see sort of, you know, never Trumpers and pro Trumpers, and those are deep value differences and ideological differences, belief differences. Um, but then there are also, you know, real conflicts over resources, you know, and, and, and those are real things that can lead to bad dynamics or can lead to better dynamics. So sometimes, you know, conflicts over objective real things, sometimes it is over just a misunderstanding or a sense of disrespect. And conflicts are very dynamic. So, you know, it might be that you and I have a small misunderstanding, but then how I respond to it um, then becomes the issue because you felt disrespected by me or you felt your people are disrespected by me or some principles, or, you know, and then things escalate and more people get involved. And they, so conflicts change over time as well. So there are, you know, there are different types of conflicts. There are different, um, and, and the different types of conflicts require different kinds of strategies. Um, you know, in the West, we're very fond of what I would call talk therapies or talking things out. And there's a lot of value to sitting down with someone that you're having tension 
or disagreements with, uh, there's a lot of value in sitting, sitting down and talking those out. They don't solve all conflicts. Um, they may make the relationships more uh, constructive and satisfying, um, but sometimes you need to re really use very different kinds of thinking, very different kinds of strategies for much more difficult conflicts. Mm. For those ones where it is value-based conflict, which I feel like I'm not usually in that. I know some individuals that are more in that category of how they respond to things. I'm more distant from items, so I wouldn't ever really get heavily value-based in conflict. But for those so that are... What if it was a conflict over uh, the, the current administration's policy towards Iran? Do you have a strong feeling or opinion or attitude around how the Trump administration in particular has responded to that? Right. Uh, so I have, like, my opinions are sort of light in nature. I kind of disconnect, uh, specifically to me, I sort of disconnect from elements of that we are apart and I try to find what can I bring to the table today, like a plus sign kind of toward yeah. it. So it's not exactly, sure. uh, I'm not really solving either side of the conflict, but I'm trying to bring a positive end to it. So it's not exactly connected. Sure. But sometimes I'll have viewpoints, but there's definitely other people who have way heavier viewpoints yeah. that it's like it's us or them kind of thing. And I noticed that, but yes, if I see something that doesn't really make sense, I usually just look at it like it doesn't make sense, but I don't look at it so much like, um, right or wrong, good and evil. Yeah. Sort of like that. <clears throat> yeah. Speaking of actually that, um, is there any applicability to this kind of thought? I sort of think of all of humanity as a collective consciousness and that we as subgroups of people are like decision trees in that big brain so then conflicts would be like the neurons fighting over a certain um how strong of a signal they send out and one signal wins out here and then here and then it makes a decision and it's bigger is there mm -hmm. something to that well it's an interesting metaphor i think um i mean conflict definitely similar to the neurological system uh has energy right conflict brings energy mm -hmm. when there's conflict when you have an internal conflict over something that's important to you, you know, should I do this or should I do, should I go outside or should I stay inside right now? Um, you know, we put energy into that, right? Because it's concerning to us and we're trying to make sense of it. When there's conflict in relationships, it definitely takes energy, right? It it can spurn or spawn energy, but it it can also take energy away from us. Mm -hmm. so energy is a is a sort of great metaphor, I think, for conflict because it you know, it both triggers energy. You know, if you walk down the street and somebody's in an altercation, we look, we pay attention, you know, and conflict is central to novels and movies and television shows, you know, in order to draw us in, to draw our attention. So it definitely um, elicits energy from us, but it also sort of takes energy from us, right? So in that way, I think the metaphor around energy makes sense. And I like, what I like about your the neurological metaphor is that it's complex and oftentimes we think of conflicts as you know between two things like israel palestine we think of the conflict between you know those two communities well the truth is the reality of of the dynamics around israeli palestinian relationships is that they're immensely complicated and there are so many divisions and subdivisions within the Palestinian communities and within the Israeli communities, um, and that there's sort of layers of issues and identity problems, but also just the, the subdivisions are so profound. You know, I was once driving out of Bethlehem, which is in, um, in the West Bank, um, and I was driving down the road, and my colleagues who worked for a German NGO there uh, helping basically in the refugee camps, pointed out to me that on the left side of the road, there was um, a refugee camp that had was pretty dilapidated and, and, and looked largely destroyed, but still inhabited. And on the right side of the road, there was a municipality, like a township, that looked much more sort of functional, functional and um, habitable and uh, intact. And what they explained to me is that at some point, you know, uh, 
Palestinian refugees are a protest movement. And so they oftentimes will deny um, aid or you know, repairs because they don't want to normalize their status. It's a protest, right? They see it as temporary. But at some point, their children or their children grow tired of that and want a better life. And so they'll cross the street and move into a municipality that gets support um, but that also, to some degree, gives up the fight as, as, as viewed by the other side. Mm -hmm. so, you have, so then you have significant tensions between those two communities, which are the same families, fighting to some degree the same fight, but approaching it in very different ways. And, and there's tremendous tension between those communities. And that's just one slice of the, you know, of the hundreds, if not thousands, of divisions and dimensions to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We talk about it as two entities, but it is this network of interlinked disputes and grievances and love and loyalty and, and, and closeness, right, that exists in the, in the sort of fabric of that conflict. And so I think your metaphor of a neurological network is a good illustration of the fact that particularly these more long-term complicated um, enduring conflicts are these networks of different parties and different conflicts, some with alliances and love, some with uh, you know, hate and enmity, and some with a combination of both um, that are highly complicated um, and, you know, humans like to simplify or simplify things that are threatening. And so we talk about it as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But it's obviously much more nuanced and dynamic than that. Um, and so we definitely need better metaphors to understand them. Right. Yeah, there's layers to it. I like to think more broad, yeah, broadly. And then also the energy that you brought up, that's a great way. To, I always like to, when there is some issue... I don't want to toss my energy at it. I'd like to go a little bit broader than what I'm seeing. I have an example. One time I was in a basketball game and I went to do a move and I like ran into somebody with part of my arm and he thought I did it on purpose or something. So then he took a ball and he threw it as hard as he could at me and he missed me and hit somebody else because usually when people are angry, they, they, right. kind of, uh, they go off. It's not controlled. And I was just like, I paused and I was like, that wasn't nice. And it didn't really make sense. This is like a regular street game and it didn't really fit, but... I just didn't, I don't give credit to the, the momentary lapse in judgment. Sure. And so I like to go broader and save my energy for something that seems more relevant in the future. Sure. That's the energy one. And then the one you just described about like Palestine and Israel, same thing like with China. Let's say you could say they built a lot of the world's things or manufacturing and pollution is connected to it. But a lot of the world also went to them to use them for that. So it's not that simple. They can just say bad country or something. Yeah, no, and we, again, we do tend to oversimplify and um, it's, you know, it's hard to understand complex things and particularly the more threatening they become, it is, it's easier to oversimplify. And, you know, there is a tendency politically to blame, you know, one of the assumptions you make in your basketball game is, you know, there is a difference in, in, uh, in violence between what they call ex expressive violence and instrumental violence. And expressive violence is, you know, something happens and I feel fed up and insulted and I lash out. Um, and, you know, it's like a crime of passion, mm -hmm. right? And the difference between that and instrumental violence is instrumental violence is intentional. You know, you're thinking about like, you're planning a crime or you're planning something that has a payoff, right? Mm -hmm. And those are very different kinds of processes. Sometimes they happen together where there's a, you know, an explosion and then there's some intentional <laughs> cleanup happening afterwards, but they're very different phenomena, right? Whether our passions are triggered and we're reacting or whether we're intentionally using a conflict. Mm -hmm. It's like prefrontal cortex more so versus like amygdala based fear reaction or something. Exactly, a primitive response. <laughs> Lizard brain, I must do something. Yeah, now, that's one thing I want to take a look at. So in relation to the pandemic, you had discussed how this could shock the system in some ways and lead to a change in polarization in the country. What are some possible alterations that may show up or are showing up in the near future as related yeah. to this pandemic? Sure. So I, you know, as you know, I've written some of the, written some about some of this um, 
and I have a book coming out called The Way Out, mm -hmm. which talks about the current state of political polarization that we're in, which is decades long. You know, it's we've been sort of separating culturally, geographically, and politically for about 50 years or longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're on a, a strong uh, wave of division. And when patterns become so ensconced that, you know, children are socialized into seeing the world in certain, in different ways and seeing the other as an enemy. And there are generations that are raised in that. Very, very hard to change those things. There are no simple solutions and it could be gerrymandering and voter oppression and it can be divisive leaders and it can be, you know, Fox News or MSNBC, all of these things play a role. But more importantly, what happens is they, you know, they start to kind of elements feed on each other. Um, our psychology feeds on our relationships and our in-groups and that feeds on our, the media we, we consume and the politics we practice and, and they start to form, you know, very different kinds of realities and very different kinds of dynamics, which take on sort of a vicious cycle and are very hard to break. Hmm. Uh, and so under those conditions, um, shocks like we're currently experiencing with the pandemic um, can provide um, oh, a couple of things. There's sort of two scenarios that I talk about. I mean, clearly what we saw initially um, here and elsewhere around the world is that the political polarization affected even our understanding of the pandemic and the response to the pandemic, right? So one side sort of saw it as, as a threat to Donald Trump's presidency, saw it as a threat believed it was another hoax or it was a liberal media phenomenon and you know and then the, and the progressives responded differently and paid much more attention to science and what the scientists were saying so there again the, the initial reaction was strongly affected by our polarization we're seeing some thawing and dissipation of that i think as the crisis becomes more acute as it moves beyond the cities, because it's been primarily in urban areas that are more densely populated, but as it starts to spread elsewhere and really affect you know, more people's lives, mm -hmm. you start to see a, a, a more general sense of what I call the common enemy scenario. There's a sociologist once said that there's you know, nothing that unites a nation like a, like a common threat or mm -hmm. a common enemy, right? And this is a biological enemy of the human species right now. And as we start to realize that, you, you do start to see more solidarity and unity, like the fact that the Senate was able to pass um, unanimously a, a, a stimulus bill, right? We haven't, the Senate hasn't done that for a long time. You know? right. So you do start to see some evidence of unification just because of the threat. And again, depending on how long this lasts, how acute it is, how devastating it is, um, it can start to really reorganize the political structures and preferences and arrangements and, and make the kind of vitriol and attack and divisiveness that has been so common less relevant, certainly less popular um, when people are really seeking competent leadership uh, sort of even-headed leadership um, and, and efficacy. We want to see a government that's functioning in response to this, right? So, so one scenario that I write about is what's called the common enemy scenario, where this threat unites us politically um, across these big cultural divides that we have now. And again, as I said, there's some evidence of that emerging. Um, sometimes that's temporary, right? It's just going to, you know, there's evidence in, for example, in the 2004 tsunami that took place in Indonesia, you saw groups that had been warring for decades sort of put down their arms and go help rebuild communities. And then out of that, really a peace agreement was sort of reached. So there are times when you have a natural disaster like this, where suddenly the fight that you're in makes no sense and you at least temporarily regroup, but that can have a life of its own and lead to more, you know, of a coming together and a, a rapprochement. Um, so that, that scenario is certainly possible, but it's also the case that sometimes it's temporary and then people go back to politics or to business as usual. So one of the questions is really how acute 
and devastating this pan pandemic will be and how much it will sort of shake up our political attitudes and political structures and the sort of divis divisiveness of this country and the world because we see this you know, across the world. Um, the other scenario that I talk about is, is, is kind of more interesting because it's more counterintuitive, counterintuitive and it's called the political shock wave scenario. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, again, when you have relationships that are long-term and really in a, sort of a groove and entrenched patterns. And so, you know, this is true in marriages. You have marriages that people have been together for, you know, five years, 10 years, 25 years. They move into patterns that are pretty, pretty ensconced. Mm -hmm. And and it's hard to change those patterns, even if you intentionally want to. Um, it sort of can be a, a difficult thing to do. Um, and yet, what they find is that when some major shock happens, like a health crisis or a loss of a loved one or loss of a job, or something significant like this, a pandemic, a, you know, the economic consequences of this, when there are major shocks to systems. What you often, what you sometimes see is, you know, sort of minor changes initially, minor responses, changes in attitudes and behaviors and preferences and norms. Um, but they they kind of trigger other changes, which trigger other changes, and then within a period of time, you can see a really qualitative change in something, right? And so there's interesting research on this in the international. Uh, affairs world where they look at interstate relationships and some interstate nations like Iran and the US right now get stuck in decades long patterns of animosity and contempt where they're trying to block and obstruct each other um, or worse for decades at a time. Mm -hmm. What you see is that about 75% of those kinds of what they call enduring rivalries long-term destructive patterns, about 75% of them end within 10 years of some major political destabilizing shock. It can be an assassination or a coup attempt or, or it can be the end of the Cold War, something positive like that. Um, but you see these delayed, what we call nonlinear effects, because it destabilizes the status quo. Mm -hmm. and how people think and feel and act and vote starts to change, but you don't see big emergent effects around that until maybe uh, two, five, ten years later, and then you see major shifts. And so what that means is that certainly in the U.S., with the degree to which this pandemic is affecting us, but worldwide as well, um, you see the potential now. Um, the destabilizing consequences, which again are oftentimes experienced very negatively and are <clears throat> have all kinds of negative consequences, but they offer kind of platform for real resets, changes in course, and ultimately for more functional governing and more functional relationships between political parties or warring ethnic groups. You know, you could see the, the end of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict come out of a time when suddenly a pandemic is more threatening than anything else, right? So these possibilities exist. It is in that way a time of tremendous potential if we can see it as such, recognize it as such, and start to do the things that could move us in a more constructive or collaborative direction, as opposed to see this as an opportunity for my political group to vilify your political group and to further divide, right? So it is a, it's, a, it's an opportune time, it's a promising time in that way. Mm -hmm. um, terrifying and anxiety provoking as it is, um, it, 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 is a, it is a reset um, or, it, or offers the potential for a significant reset. And so that's something that I think we need to think very carefully about. Um, because I think it was Rahm Emanuel that said, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste, you know, <laughs> because it does offer the chance for things to change that have been not going well. Look, our country is imprisons more people than anybody else. We have high levels of anxiety, low levels of happiness, increasing suicide ideation and addiction. 
we have addiction to various things, including devices. You know, we're, we're more and more alienated from each other and our political polarization is, is a, run, a runaway phenomenon. So we definitely, you know, and our hyper consumerism is nuts. You know, our addiction to fast fashion is insane, right? So definitely we are due for a reset and this offers the, that possibility, whether or not our leaders are, um, can see it as that and can sort of promote the kinds of things that will lead us in a more constructive direction is yet to be seen. But that's something I think we need to be mindful of and aware of as we move forward. Hmm. A lot of thoughts came to mind as you were describing that, the concept of punctuated equilibrium and how it can be very healthy. Occasionally, boom, there's suddenly some shakeup. And then after that, oh, the energy required to do these things suddenly doesn't seem as bad compared to this or that. So I'll just start doing this. That's right. It's, you're absolutely right. The, the work that I cited in the international community is based on work by a and then Paul Deal and Gary Getz, they wrote a book called War and Peace and International Rivalry in 2001, and have done subsequent work. Um, and their theoretical model is one of punctuated um, equilibrium. It is, you know, that you're in the status quo, and then there's some kind of rupture. But those ruptures often, because there are so many things that are keeping the patterns in place, they're not predictable, right? Mm -hmm. But it, lead to a, a variety of kind of cascading changes, then you might see some dramatic change. It doesn't mean that the change will stay. I mean, I like to cite the, the Arab Spring as an illustration of this because, um, you know, the Arab Spring was this major set of kind of revolts and revolutions across the Middle East and North African region. Um, and 10 years before the Arab Spring was 9-11 and the American incursions in Iraq and Afghanistan. So major political shocks led to a variety of changes that ultimately led to a variety of changes nationally in, in Egypt and Syria and Tunisia and elsewhere. Many of them either returned to the same kind of autocracy um, or ended up in chaos like Syria and Libya um, or started to show some promise of a different trajectory like Tunisia. So they, it, the, the, that, those shocks did not guarantee any end result. Mm -hmm. They just guaranteed change. You know, there was considerable change, at least temporarily, and mm -hmm. some of them for the better and several of them for the worse. Right. Yeah, it's what do you do at the moment. You have to do something with sometimes changing moments. So then it, it's a really uh, not as far as people have to be divided, but it's very dividing as far as how people respond at this moment because some people will pull back and this will be an empty period and some people will say this is the the real chance i feel healthier than before because of this this and this the pollution's actually reduced in some form but yeah. there's some real opportunity to like oh i'm going to correct this thing that i didn't do for seven years or eight years or well it's you know people say that in war they say in war that they feel you know that they my father was in world war ii and mm. you know, he and others I know have described the experience as being that, that they never lived life like that. They were never more alive than in war, which is the, you know, the, the, the irony, right? War is about death and destruction and mayhem. And yet people during those times can feel very alive. I mean, I think, again, this is different from war um, in a lot of ways um, because the enemy is invisible and it's pervasive and it's, you know, biological and it's not a social phenomenon so it's harder to sort of scapegoat although we'll certainly scapegoat <laughs> China and any other uh, any other chances we get we'll scapegoat um, but it it definitely forces people into out of automatic pilot you know where we spend 90 some percent of our lives in sort of automatic rhythms um, and forces us to regroup and rethink um, and that is a profound opportunity and gift if we see it as such and capitalize on it. Mm -hmm. I've always had this idea in my mind that everything that we connect with joy connects back to that human responsive instinct. And anytime we see something even close to that, those are the coolest things in our society. We're like, oh, look at that, or that person did that. Or that. And we're like, oh, we wish we want to be closer to that, that force, which is the complete opposite side of the spectrum from being like completely spoiled and just sitting there like a no, no drive. Yeah. 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 
one last thing I wanted to discuss about your writings and um, in for books and also publications. How has it progressed over the years? Did you change the focus of what you were writing about based on the moment, or is it like a pro progression more towards uh, what you connect with? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so my the general trajectory is that you know I, I got interested in in conflict as I described through working with violent adolescents, and then as I studied it, I got particularly interested in more difficult, intractable conflicts, just because we didn't know much about them. We we learned a lot about how to work out our our, ma our minor or moderate differences through negotiating and talking it out or dialogue or mediation and diplomacy, we've, we've gotten much better at that. But there is this extreme, there, there are these extreme pathologies. And to some degree, the, my experience of the conditions that the youth lived in, in the, when I worked in the hospital, was a more intractable problem. They were, you know, they were products of their communities and their families and, you know, legacies of addiction and poverty. Um, and they were the sort of products of that. And so that was a much bigger problem. And it wasn't a problem that could be negotiated, right? Or managed mm -hmm. in a simpler sense. So I became more interested in what we call intractable problems or intractable conflicts. And, <clears throat> and so that I spent the first chunk of my career studying that, thinking about that, and then working on that in multidisciplinary teams. Um, and, and mostly applying ideas and insights from complexity science, from applied mathematics, to understand why some, you know, conflicts, problems, communities get stuck in dynamics that just keep them trapped, despite the fact that things change, people leave, people die, leadership changes, policy changes, but they still sort of stay in that pattern. And how do we understand that? So I studied that, I worked with a team and many students um, on those issues for a long time and have written a lot about that. But the other thing I became more interested in is sort of the other side of the equation, which is um, sustainably peaceful societies. Um, very few people study peaceful societies. Uh -huh. study peacemaking and peace building and you know, peacekeeping in the context of war and violence and getting out of it. Um, but, but we don't really study these societies that are able to sustain peace for 50, 100, 200, 300 years, right? And there are histories and current societies that do that. And so I became interested in that. It's, in some ways, it's the same thing. These are stable states, right? One is an equilibrium of conflict and violence and, and enmity. The other is an equilibrium of peace and, and um, tolerance and the structures and habits and institutions that help communities navigate when there is a shock, a, you know, an economic shock or a demographic change. How do they, how do they stay there? So, so for the past about 10 years, but more particularly, more, most, uh, been more focused on it for the past five years, I've worked with a group of people that are studying sustainably peaceful societies. One of them is an anthropologist named Doug Fry, who has a long history in studying uh, um, the ethnographies of peaceful societies and trying to glean insights from them. But I also work with Larry Leibovitch, who's a mathematician and an astrophysicist, who's a sort of a modeler. Uh, and I work with Josh Fisher and Alexa Jen Perel and others who have been central to our understanding of these societies. So I work in these multidisciplinary teams, um, both to understand intractability and to understand sustainable peace. And both of those threads of our research inform how I'm thinking about polarization and mitigating polarization. Because I think the patterns of political polarization that we're in are misunderstood. There are oftentimes people say, well, it's all about moral value differences, or it's about the internet, or it's about media. And that's true, but it's more that these are complex systems that become, evolve into patterns which become extremely strong patterns that we call attractors. In mathematics, they call them attractors that really resist change. Um, and so you can change pieces of it, but there are too many compensatory mechanisms in keeping them in place. And so I've been trying to apply that to intractable conflicts and to sustainably peaceful societies. 
Now I'm applying it to our understanding of this pattern of polarization that we're trapped in and how, how you have to think about those kinds of patterns differently and approach them differently. Um, and so that's, that's been my general trajectory of my research. It's almost like the opposite of building a car that you would want to drive on that would be smooth because everything is completely stabilized all the way. You're trying to maybe undo all the stabilization that's keeping something completely smooth the whole time, which maybe exactly. shouldn't be there. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. One other thing that you mentioned right there, I just have to add that in the multidisciplinary approach has been recently looked at as very important because so many fields have not been connected much uh, in past decades and are now way being connected way more yeah. overlap between math or economics or psychology. It wasn't happening before and it's the value is really showing up a lot. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let me just say quickly that I think that you're right, that is a trend. They're in fact building, many universities are building buildings that are interdisciplinary science centers where they physically force physicists and chemists and psychologists and anthropologists to share the same space so that they talk more to each other and interact more with, it, with each other. I'll say that, you know, I've worked in several of these teams. It's hard work because you usually come in with a language, a mindset, a set of methods and assumptions about science that um, are very different. And so, and if you work with top people, they tend to do be in their world and their bubbles for a long time. And so they're, they're hard processes to really do synthetically, to really do where you really integrate. It's, it's more likely to do parallel play where physicists will tell me what they think about conflict and an anthropologist will tell me and then I may integrate some of that myself. But to actually get on a team, take on a problem and work together is a particularly challenging thing to do. Um, but I agree with you completely that it is kinds of problems that we're facing like the pandemic, but um, also like, uh, you know, I, I am on the faculty of the Earth Institute at Columbia University um, and that's where I do a lot of my international peace work. And I was on a, 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 a call with the faculty this week where five of the top experts in the world talked about their work on the pandemic. Everything from modeling it, to understanding the sort of political mechanisms that allowed it, to understanding you know, the mitigating factors that need to be organized for politically in, the, in societies very different perspectives from MDs and PhDs and physicists and modelers, epidemiologists, fascinating, right? And, and it's a very rich environment to learn from people. But even the Earth Institute has been a difficult place to synthesize and to bring these entities together in service of something. But again, that's another opportunity the pandemic gives us is it forces us to come together in unity and solidarity around a particular issue or set of issues and make sense and hopefully offer some useful advice. Mm -hmm. There's a strong grounding force at the current moment. What right. is, I always like to check this one. What is one message if you had a megaphone to all 7.8 billion people on the planet that you would want them to know about um, what you have uh, studied or a message you would want them to know for themselves? Well, the most simple, um, finding from all of the work, I think, in, in, in conflict and peace is the power of cooperation. And that if you, you know, conflict, again, as I said, is a, is a natural occurring thing, it just happens. If you view conflicts that come up as problems that you mutually share with the other parties and that you can mutually work out, then it leads to much more constructive outcomes than if you view conflicts as win-lose gains where your job is to prevail or to beat the other side. And if you see conflicts as that, they tend to escalate, become more destructive, and then can culminate in terrible things, right? So the, 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 find, the major finding of Mort Deutsch's decades of work is that you know, when conflicts come up, if groups can see them as mutual problems, they will tend to approach them in ways where more people are sort of satisfied with the process and the outcomes. If when those conflicts come up, they see them as win-lose games, then they tend to bring out the worst in us. And so the pandemic, again, 
offers an opportunity for us to see our mutuality, to see that we're all affected by this, that we need each other in order to address this effectively. It really offers that opportunity, but it offer, also offers, you know, divisive politicians opportunities to scapegoat and blame and polarize and further polarize. Um, and so the choice is ours, what we do with these kinds of threats. Mm. That's a great message. I can take it into account personally too. Professor Coleman, I would like to thank you for having been on this episode of the Armin Show podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for, it was an interesting conversation. I appreciate your time uh, and I look forward to sharing it. I enjoyed it very much. And we are out.